We are now recording uh, to the cloud, and these this will be posted later today. Um, get rid of that. So I am Jen Bonet. I am the executive director of the Creative Coast, and this is one of our lunchtime topics. Um, we are slowing down a little bit for the summer. We have spent um, the last three months producing content every Tuesday and Thursday at lunchtime, and you're going to start to see that it's more like once a week. Because I just think um, people are in Zoom overload. <laughs> and, and the other thing is it's summer, so I think some people are, um, you know, going on vacation and things like that. So um, we usually slow down our content during the summer. Um, you know, the Creative Coast is a nonprofit organization. It's existed since about 2001 here in Savannah, Georgia, funded by the City of Savannah and the CEDA, the Savannah Economic Development Association as well as other organizations and we're focused on um, this intersection of creativity creatives technology and entrepreneurship um, and really trying to help uh, jumpstart the creative technology economy in the city of savannah or the region of savannah um, today's topic is funding your business during covid 19 and i am going to personally teach this um, I'm going to, let's see a little different when you're sharing your screen uh, and trying to manage the people and stuff at the same time. So, um, I this is me circa 19, oh, it's probably 2001. Um, in People Magazine, I'm a recovering entrepreneur. I've co founded uh, seven companies. Uh, Creative Coast is the second nonprofit that I've led. Uh, the rest of the, the companies were for profit. Three of those companies, I sought angel and venture capital. And we, uh, myself and my co founders raised $52 million over those three companies. And then each of those companies sold uh, for profit for our investors, which is a successful exit. Moved here two years ago to come work for CETA and the Creative Coast to help catalyze this community. Um, and so I would love to open up um the mics to the participants for a sec so that i can kind of see if i can tailor um this talk uh, there, there's a whole bunch of slides but i want to kind of tailor my topics to you knowing what kind of businesses you are so if you could um i guess we'll start with kat why don't you introduce yourself what kind of business you're you're investigating uh what stage you're at do you have employees and whether you're a minority or female employer uh, or founder because um, certain types of funding mechanisms apply to different types of businesses. So, Kat, why don't you start? Okay, great. Um, hey, everybody. My name is um, Kat McGuire, and my business is still in its complete infancy. Um, the type of business that it is, is it is a way to um, organize um, volunteerism so that people can get actually paid rather than doing unpaid work. So the concept of it was to offer more um, of an opportunity to people who generally cannot due to economic reasons volunteer, but who would like to do work that has more meaning. Again, I am still in the infancy stage sort of like kicking around a little bit of a way to um, tweak it um, partially because of what's going on currently in the economy and partially because um, I've been at home a lot so and that, it's harder to get out. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your idea with us. Okay. A little less detail for all of you. All I really need to know is, are you a nonprofit? Are you a for-profit? Are you looking at um, the type of business? Meaning, is it a services-based business? Is it a brick and mortar business? Is it a retail? Is it res restaurant hospitality? Um, is it software technology, whatnot? Because that way I can, you know, are you pre-revenue, post-revenue, su such that I can hone in on specific uh, funding mechanisms that might be best for you? So you're, Pre-revenue pre idea stage, are you thinking for-profit or non-profit is the big question I have for you. At the time, I'm thinking non-profit. Okay, cool. Obviously, female founder. Yes. Okay, awesome. How about you, Megan? Hi, um, I'm Megan Curley. I'm the Director of Development 
for Historic Savannah Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization that's been in the community since 19... Uh, 55 and um, we started with the founding of the Davenport House Museum um, and that really kick-started the preservation movement in Savannah. Um, I'm a professional fundraiser, a certified fundraising executive and I've been in many shops and as you know fundraising is going to look incredibly different in the future and so I'm curious as to uh, what ideas I could glean um, from from this forum. Okay, nonprofit, great. Um, Karen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am actually sort of listening in for two organizations uh, with which I'm involved. Um, one is I'm on the board of uh, an organization called Elevate Savannah. Um, it is a, an affiliate of a national organization called Elevate, which is a mentoring program for um, underserved urban youth. And so we are brand new in Savannah as of January, and uh, you know, just looking for ideas to, to fundraise for that organization. And I'm also on the fundraising uh, development committee for Mountain Film Savannah, which is also kind of on the educational side. It's um, uh, movies that, that inspire um, the parent, or parent film festival is in Telluride, and uh, we bring select films to Savannah every January. Are they both nonprofits? Yes, they are. Okay. I didn't know if Mountain Film was. And I'm familiar with Elevate from um, my time in Atlanta, actually. So oh, fantastic. Very cool. mm -hmm. um, this is going to be a little bit probably more focused on businesses, per se, because that's my area of expertise. Uh, that being said, um, since all three of you are nonprofits, as I go through this, I can try and highlight some of my ideas around nonprofits. Um, but then again, I am recording this for a larger audience, so I do want to share all the different mechanisms. Um, and there's about 17 that I've sort of identified, and it, I did it more on stage than type of business. So um, about the current funding environment, right? And this probably applies really well to nonprofits because most of your um, you, you could parallel angel funding, which is individual high net worth individuals with your typical individual donors, right? And you could, typically, you could look at venture capital as a little bit like foundational donors, right? Um, you know, the angel funding high net worth individuals, it's gonna be really hard with all the uncertainty. Um, that's just a fact, right? Um, we, while the stock markets come back, you know, almost entirely and for some certain stocks, it's over, it's gone, you know, through the roof. Um, we still don't really know what's coming. So the, you know, these angel investments, individuals that make investments in companies um, are certainly doing so to potentially get a higher uh, reward. And it's just, big, it's an alternative investment to using the stock market. Um, that being said, you know, high net worth individuals that feel really passionate about, say, a nonprofit organization and their charter, um, if they have what we call dry powder, you know, if they have the funds to, to, to spend, they're going to spend. I mean, I think we saw that with you, Coastal, uh, Coastal United Ways campaign for the COVID-19 response, um, you know, very quickly, nearly a million dollars was raised for individuals that were really hurting because of this. And I think that's just the communities coming together. So I think, you know, if there's a passion, if, if you find an individual that's passionate about your cause, your idea, you'll be able to potentially get funding, but um, the typical angel funding is gonna be hard. The venture capital and foundational funding, you know, they raised their money already, right? And if there's money in their um, war chest, um, there's typically a time frame that they have to spend it, right? And that's why you're seeing a lot of foundations right now do grants, right? Uh, they have money that they're supposed to allocate and get out there. And so there's a lot of uh, current grant opportunities um, that I've seen come across from everyone from the, the EDA, um, there's one out there from opendata.gov right now. Um, there, there's just a ton of opportunities for nonprofits if you're going after grant money. Um, and then with venture capital, if you're a startup and you're, and you're at, I would say, early growth stage, um, you know, th these venture capitalists 
have a limited time window to spend their money to get an investment within the five to tier, 10 year window that their investors are expecting. The challenge is that they're reinvesting in the companies that they've already invested in. So they're trying to sure up the companies that they've already made an investment in to ensure that they survive. And then they're looking for interesting opportunities, right? So I've seen uh, a lot of venture capital go towards medical devices or medical healthcare solutions that are gonna help with this current situation, right? But they're looking for companies that have strong leadership and or product market fit already. And then SBA backed banks or loan program and or loan programs are the easiest source of funds for companies with a track record. And this is true uh, for nonprofits today as well. Um, the, the SBA loan programs that they announced for COVID-19 were, are applicable, 100% applicable to nonprofits. In fact, I just got um, an idle loan for the Creative Coast. So that's kind of an overview of the current environment. I uh, gotta put my disclaimer. Um, first of all, not all types of businesses will be, uh, will be able to use all of these options. And secondarily, you may not like what I have to say. <laughs> um, you know, uh, cause I'm trying to give you kind of the, what I see happening in the marketplace, right? And that's, that was kind of what that previous slide was, was about. Um, so overall, my best advice to anybody is don't seek funding right now, right? Hunker down, reduce your spending, take advantage of the uh, options from the CARE Act, um, and that includes the IDLE, the paid pe Paycheck Protection Program, and the unexpanded unemployment options. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about each of those as we move forward. Uh, and really, when I think about fundraising right now, I have to think about what stage are you in? You know, are you at idea stage? Are you at kind of startup stage and you've got a product that's going into the market, right? Are you at growth stage, meaning you've got customers, you've got revenue, or are you at the expansion stage? Um, and really what kind of funding is available to you at each level and some that may have been possible in the past at a certain level is going to be really hard to get right now so it's kind of my way of thinking through this um seed or startup stage and i'm going to define that as less than 25 paying customers right and uh so this is not well i guess the grant part is going to potentially tie into nonprofits, but you know, from a Cedar startup pay stage, you know, self-funding, self extending your personal runway, not necessarily the business's runway, you know, friends and family, pitch competitions, crowdfunding, grants, and customer prepayment. And I've got a slide for each, so. You know, self-funding, 82% of all entrepreneurs draw their own savings uh, to fund their businesses. This includes savings, home equity lines, borrowing from retirement funds, credit card debt, um, I've always used savings um, and friends and family to start some of my early companies. And then later as I got smarter, I started to use um, customer sales. Um, so I don't recommend anybody take against their home and their retirement account, but um, a lot of people do, 82% of the people do. So I think one of the things that people can think about right now is how do you extend your personal runway? How do you get cash flow for you as a person if you're at, if your idea or seed stage and you're launching a company? How do you extend your runway, right? And so some things I want you to think about, right? It's like how can you find a flexible job that allows you to earn cash while still devoting, you know, the 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 brain, um, you know, the mind share of your brain power to your company, uh, to your idea, to your new nonprofit. And so, you know, can you get a gig job? Can you do Uber? Can you do Lyft? Can you do Instacart? Can you do DoorDash, Uber Eats, Postmates as a means to get some basic funding, you know, funding? Can you rent out, you know, your spare bedroom via Airbnb to get some basic funding? The other option that's come up to extend your runway under the CARES Act is that they've expanded unemployment, right? They've added an additional $600 a week for people that are, that are filed, have filed for unemployment, which means that if you made less than $42,000 a year, you now make more on unemployment than you did as an employee. 
So there's some challenges there. Um, they are talking about rolling that $600 back pretty quick because they quickly realize that people are being incentivized to stay off, on, uh, off out of work if they can. Um, but the other thing here is that people can qualify for unemployment even though they didn't recently get fired. So if you're a gig worker, a freelancer, uh, independent contractor, 1099 employee, and you've had a reduction in your hours or inability to get clients during this time and are effectively unemployed, you can file for unemployment even though you were not an employee of a company that was fired or let go or furloughed. Um, so that's really important to research. I mean, my sister quit her job in February and obviously hasn't been able to find a job since. So she filed for unemployment, right? And she qualified. So my suggestion is if you're a gig worker, a freelancer, a 1099 employee of some sort, and you've been affected uh, in your inability to find gigs, find employment, then you should try and apply to extend your runway. And this is about how do I, you extend your personal runway while you're getting your business off the ground because it's hard to fund a startup, really stage company. Um, friends and family, right? Uh, you can always go and try and, um, you know, ask family for money, right? And it's awkward. It's really awkward to go say, hey, I have this idea and I'm trying to build this company or I have this idea for a nonprofit. Would you make a donation? Would you uh, uh, help me get this off the ground? Uh, it's really important to make a business transaction, right? It's really important to explain the risks. It's really, uh, you could set it up as debt or equity. So it could be a loan that you're going to re repay or it could be that it's equity, which is ownership in the company, which obviously does not apply for nonprofits. Um, if it's a for-profit company that you're building, ideally, and you're going to seek funding later, possibly from angels or investors, you should seek accredited investors if possible, and that's basically anybody who has a net worth over a million dollars or makes $200,000 a year. Um, you should definitely hire an attorney and execute appropriate paperwork, and then you should keep them informed, just like you would any other investor. It's awkward, it's hard. My family has invested in me multiple times and um, the first time I lost their money and that's kind of embarrassing, but um, you move past it. Hopefully they believe in you uh, as much as you believe in yourself. So uh, it is an option. Uh, I think if I was to do it again, I'd, I'd structure it personally as debt instead of equity such that um, if I was asking my family for money, I'd probably do that this, this next go round, and I'm sure there will be a next go round, but um, it's, it's always an option. Um, pitch plans or business plan competitions, right? Um, so I've seen a couple of business plan competitions launch specifically after COVID-19. Uh, and, and it's an interesting opportunity, especially I believe for female and minority entrepreneurs. Um, you know, a small percentage actually win the money. And so, you know, the winner might get $15,000 or $25,000. So you need to be in it to win it. So the question is, can you win it? Um, it takes a lot of work to do the prep time and, you know, get the pitch down um, such that you can win it. Uh, but there's, I think there's, a, I would say, especially right now, there's a lot of opportunities out there for female and minority entrepreneurs to, um, to, to enter pitch competitions or business plan competitions and get noticed, right? And so now that these plans are, these competitions are on Zoom, they're not physically meeting in a certain city like you know, New York City in a big auditorium, even more people have the ability to tune in and see you quote unquote pitch, right? And so it could also be great for exposure. Um, and I've seen specific opportunities around these that are just like the only people that are allowed to apply are female or minor minority entrepreneurs. And I'll give you an example. So um, actually somebody here in town just got one. Uh, here in Savannah just got a, the, the Red Back uh, uh, Spanx Foundation's Red Backpack Award. And so she got, $5,000 and a bunch of uh, 
other um, mentorship from the Sphinx Foundation and, and all this stuff uh, related to, and it was specifically for female entrepreneurs. So um, I think, you know, now more than ever, there's a really great opportunity to uh, have that happen. Um, Karen had asked if there's pitch competitions for nonprofits, and yes, I actually have seen uh, pitch pitches for nonprofits in the past. Um, the organization that used to do it is headquartered at Atlanta. It's it's the parent organization of Hands On Atlanta, uh, and they used to do a a twice annual pitch competition for nonprofits. And along with the cash and prizes kind of came a uh, mentorship from various uh, both civic and business leaders on various skills. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, the name of that organization <laughs> will come to the top of my head. But it is, it's the parent organization of all the hands-on organizations. Um, so, yeah. All right, next, next up, crowdfunding, right? And this is, I'm gonna say specifically um, crowdfunding via the online platforms for a pre-sale of a product or for raising money for a social impact. Um, there's a different type of crowdfunding for equity. We're gonna talk about that in the second half, but this is specifically putting a campaign out there and saying you're raising money for either your organization, for a campaign or cause under your organization, for building a physical product. Um, and I, I think the challenge with this right now, I think there's a lot of different options here. So picking the right platform is important, right? If you're going with the product centered, you know, Kickstarter has a lot of success, but Kickstarter has a lot of noise too right? Um, Indiegogo's uh, better suited probably for social impact stuff. GoFundMe is seen more as personal, but I've seen uh, nonprofits raise money on it as well. So researching what crowdfunding platform is best for you in the campaign that you're running, right? So you could be a nonprofit and running a campaign for, you know, a specific film under Mountain Film Savannah, right? And, and go raise money through these platforms. I think the biggest challenge with this right now is gonna be getting heard, right? Um, both on the platform, but through social media channels and, the, and the everything, right? Even email got busier uh, in the last three months with everybody reaching out to you and telling you their COVID-19 strategy and now the Black Lives Matter strategy. And um, so being heard um, is, is getting harder uh, uh, is really hard right now. Even though everyone's online, it's really hard to get heard and noticed. Um, and then watching tone is really important too. You know, um, people are very sensitive um, to a lot of different things. And, and as when Kat and I were talking earlier about kind of, you know, do you wear a mask, do you not? Do the, the tourism that's coming in and they, are, they seem to, you know, not be mindful of the fact that we are still kind of in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you know, we have to be mindful of, of each other's viewpoints and try and figure out a way to be respectful of everyone's different, differing viewpoints and, and move forward. Um, so that becomes a challenge when you're out there on social media or through email campaigns promoting these types of activities. But I do believe this is still a, a, a very viable mechanism for run, raising money and, and specifically for a nonprofit around a specific campaign or movie or, or program. Uh, grants, right? So um, love grants, non-dilutive funding. You do not have to pay it back. Um, foundation grants, right? Foundational grants work best for the nonprofits and or businesses with a social spin. So it could be a for good, for profit or B Corp. And then there's research grants, SBIR, STTR grants. Um, that requires uh, actually kind of a scientific uh, or technologist on the team that's going to actually do deep research to develop true intellectual pop property that will then be commercialized. Um, so that, that's great. Uh, 
a great option for tech companies. Um, like I said, I've seen a lot of foundations um, out there right now doing, doing, launching new grants and new grant programs. Um, so, uh, and, and doing different grants now due to COVID-19, um, you know, I probably, you know, Elevate probably has a, a really phenomenal opportunity for grant funding and or even locally city funding, I would think in the next um, cultural arts round of, of grants for tw 2021. Um, you know, as we look at the uh, Black Lives Matter and inclusion and, you know, fixing, you know, issues that have been centuries in the making. Um, my fa so if you're an early stage seed company, my favorite is, my favorite way of raising money is customer prepayment. I call it customer funded development. You have an idea, you go out and pitch, as you're doing customer discovery, you educate potential customers on kind of what problem you're trying to solve. And if it really resonates with them, you might have the opportunity to ask them to, to pay, to have it developed. So a friend of mine did this. I've done it a couple times, but a friend of mine did this with a company and went out and, and got three or four kind of invoices uh, or, or purchase order contracts from different customers, had them write checks, and then was actually able to go hire software developers and build the product with that money and then launch it back to the, those customers. And then, um, you know, the grow the base from there, go out and get more customers from there. And so that's, that's my favorite early stage mechanism for funding a business. Because, you know, you have customers, right? And the biggest issue of an early stage customer is getting that first customer, or those first handful of customers. So, all right, so now we're gonna go into growth and expansion. And during this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about SBA Idle and the SBA PPP, which both uh, nonprofits and for profits were able to um, leverage, right? And basically, everything we went over for startups is, is pretty much available to uh, growth and expansion stage companies as well. The great thing about growth and expansion stage companies is you have customers, nonprofits have donors, right? And you also have potentially assets uh, that you can leverage, right? And so, we're going to talk about SBA loans, we're going to talk about non-traditional loans, the different types of financing that you can do via suppliers, purchase orders, royalty, uh, leasing and licensing, and then lastly we're going to talk about equity related stuff uh, and equity funding, which is essentially selling part of your company, part of the ownership, um, and or selling your entire company. So uh, commercial banks, SBA loans. So typically an SBA loan requires three to five years of company history. Um, the SBA loans are guaranteed by the SBA, but they come through your bank or a bank. Um, SBA C, the Small Business Assistance Center here in Savannah is, is an organization that you could try in addition to your bank. They're typically easier to get than a standard loan through a bank because the SBA is guaranteed it. So even if you default on it, the bank's going to get paid back. There are, I believe, 13 different types of SBA loan pro products on the market. So it all depends on how much money you want to take for how long, right? Um, and, and and whether or not it's being secured by what what assets it's being secured by whether it's land or building or whether it's just truly more like a business revenue um, it does work best with companies that have um, physical locations and a well, well understood business model so if you go in there and say i'm going to run an e-commerce business they may not get it right if i'm going to go build a software company they may not get it um, so that's why it's important to have three to five years history. Um, and usually 80% of all SBA loan applications in a region that get approved come from one or two banks. I would say that uh, that's a, probably an old statement and that the way that the PPP payroll payment 
pay, payroll protection program went is that uh, the wealth got distributed much more uh, across banks than it had previously. All right, so with that, we're gonna drill into specifically um, the SBA, EIDL, and PPP. Now, I went and checked yesterday evening. There are still funds available through both these programs. So if you did not apply, you still have an opportunity. Um, the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan, also referred to as the EIDL, E-I-D-L, is um, truly a loan. It's available for profits and nonprofits. Um, the, it's for up to two million, for up to a 30 year term. The rates on the loan are 2.75% for nonprofits, 3.75% for for profit entities, and you apply through the SBA specifically. Just, uh, I think it's like COVID 19. Dot sba.gov or something like that. Um, easy to find, just go type in SBA economic Inju injury disaster loan into Google and it will dir drive you to the thing. The, it's kind of a two part application process and you can at the very, yeah, upload some very basic information about your organization. Like how much, um, it's not, you don't have to, at the beginning stage, you do not do full financials or anything. It's like basically how much money did you make in the last 12 months from the day that you're applying? What were your expenses in the last 12 months from the day that you're applying? How many employees do you have? Um, and then at the end, uh, we're literally talking, it took 15 minutes and the last page said, do you want a, t a, a grant advance for 10K? Check, check box. Check that box, yes. You'll get $1,000 per employee. And it is a grant advance, which means that 10,000, if you get the advance, you do not have to pay it back. Um, so that's kind of phase one of the idle process. I got my $1,000 for me in the nonprofit uh, just uh, two, three weeks ago. And last night I got the email for part two which is now I have to go in and actually fill in all the details, like give them two to three years of financial history for them to decide how much of a loan I get up to 2 million, up to 30 years. And now I have to start working through that process. I'm assuming that that's going to be as painful as any loan process, any mortgage or anything I've ever done in my life. So I haven't started yet. The truth is I don't want the loan. I wanted the 10K grant. Um, or up to 10 grade grant. So um, I will be working with my accountant to figure out how I fill out that application to basically not get the loan, but be forgiven with the $1,000 that we got because it's essentially $1,000 free dollars. You know, who doesn't want that? And you could get that 1,000 per employee and it's essentially free money for your organization. So again, if if you're even if you're a nonprofit, if you did not apply for that, you should definitely be applying for that. Um, I pretty much feel the same way with payroll protection plan, right? If you have employees and you have, with assistance, with help from this program, the ability to keep them on payroll throughout COVID-19 or go back and retroactively pay them if you furloughed them, okay? You should apply for this. It's essentially free money, right? It's, it's up to $10 million. It's for profits and nonprofits. It's for two years and it's 0.5% interest, right? Now, I believe they're gonna expand this available through June 30th and you have to apply through your bank, but I believe they're expanding that uh, available through June 30th, right? And right now, but there's a, there's a law, there was a bill in the Senate that passed yesterday, and I, I'll be paying attention to see if the Senate, uh, uh, sorry, if Trump signs it, um, but there was a bill that passed the Senate yesterday that basically said they're gonna expand this period, but so it would be expanding the end date, but it would also be able to expand the forgiveness. 
And so the forgiveness part of the PPP is that if you have kept your employees on payroll or you pay them back and whatever money you pay for payroll, rent, mortgage interest, and utilities is forgivable. So say you take, two, uh, well, it started out with two months. Now I think they're the part of the proposal is that they go to four months. So two months of that is forgivable right now. So you take that money and you do not owe it. It will be forgiven. Um, and they're looking to expand that to at least four months. So again, if you had employees, if you know, if you're a one person organization, probably doesn't make sense, right? But if you have a handful of employees and you can go after this money, uh, you should do it. It's practically free money, right? Um, and if you plan it such that you only take an amount that is based on payroll, rent, mortgage interest and utilities for the period that the new bill allows for, um, you won't have to pay anything back. You will have to prove that it was used for those things, but you won't have to pay anything back. And so this is for all practical, these two programs for all practical purposes is free money. Um, and so everyone should take advantage of it from my perspective that can. And there's still money out there in both programs as of last night. Uh, the second one, payroll protection plan, you apply through your bank. Um, so you should talk to your banker about that. Uh, if you do not have a banker, you can apply through some of the online places like Square, uh, the payment provider Square, um, the uh, Fundera, Cabbage, and some of those other organizations. Um, okay. Now, non-traditional loans, uh, for, for other businesses, for-profit entities, non-traditional loans are an option. Um, so banks look at your credit score and your um, business performance and how long you've been in business. Cabbage, Amazon, PayPal, uh, and, and organizations like Fundera all have these non-traditional loans that they don't actually look at your credit score. Um, they actually primarily look at your sales traction. So you have to have X numbers of, of sales over the last X months. But what they're doing is they're kind of forecasting your future sales volume and lending you money based on those future sales. Um, and they use machine learning and algorithms to figure that out. Uh, supplier financing. Um, so you, you can even do this with your your landlord in some cases, right? If you're selling physical products um, and you can convince your supplier to um, give you 60, 90 day terms, you can purchase the product and sell the product before you have to pay for them. And uh, I, know, um, I know a number of organizations that have done something kind of similar with their landlords, right? And renegotiated uh, to, to pay less rent for the last couple of months while the businesses were closed. Um, and so that may be a possibility to like, you know, leverage your, your relationship there. Um, B2B purchase order financing. So uh, if you have um, purchase orders or invoices that come in and you're waiting for your customer to pay you, um, there are organizations like Now Account out of Atlanta, a friend of mine runs it, or Fundbox that will actually buy your purchase order, your sales order from you. They'll follow up with the customer. It really looks like you're following up with the customer. It's all branded for you, but you don't have to wait for the cash. Um, they collect the funds from the customer directly and they keep a, a percentage or two uh, in order to, to make that happen. Um, so you get money now, you pay them a fee for doing this for you, um, but, but it's an option. Royalty-based financing. I have Mr. Wonderful here from uh, uh, Shark Tank, because this is what he loves to do, right? This is what like his number one option is when he's talking to an entrepreneur 
on the tank, right? He's always making an offer that's a loan and that you pay him back X percent of every sale until you pay him back. Um, and or for him, he usually adds on maybe for life, right? So you pay him back and then some. Um, and so it's, it's considered royalty-based financing. Somebody's paying you, uh, you know, you're paying them every time you have a sale, essentially for the, them giving you the money up front. And then there's leasing, leasing or licensing fees, right? This works best for businesses with an asset, list, location, intellectual property. And there's a picture of the MBA sign, I believe this was at a Nike, Nike store or something like that in Chicago, um, right? NBA, if you think about all, every time somebody buys a, a shirt, t-shirt, jersey, hat with a college sports emblem on it, you know, somebody, that merchant has licensed the access to that logo, you know, in order to sell that shirt and they pay a fee for that, right? So if you own intellectual property, you own a list, um, you know, you could rent your, if you've got 10,000 email subscribers, you could lease out your list to a partner and make money doing so, right? And so um, that's a funding source. And then the last stuff I'm gonna go into is just all equity funding. Um, you know, an equity funding is essentially, you know, you're, you're seeking an investment in your company. Uh, that investment is actually giving that investor a percentage of ownership in your company, right? And you're doing so to accelerate your growth, right? But the catch is the investor expects a return. Right? And they expect, they expect a return typically through an exit event. So equity funding is really only an option if you intend to at some point in the future sell your business because you need to be able to have that exit opportunity to give the return, right? And when we think about um, the sources of equity funding, this is kind of a little graph that shows when you're early stage or concept, stage or prototype stage you're talking friends the founders and friends and family you might be talking grants or angel groups right and that leads into the product stage which would be those early customers right and then venture capital is primarily for the growth stage so you have a product you have customers and then once you're you're scaling the company then um, if, when you're in the expansion phase that's where private equity or banks are going public comes into play um, Right, and so when we start thinking about sources of equity funding for later stage companies, one of the things you can look at is accelerator company, accelerator programs. Now, this four months ago, accelerator programs would have been an option for seed and startup as well. But most of the accelerator programs today have kind of pivoted to a point where they want sales. They want customers. So if you're not in a position to really have say that you've found product market fit and you're ready to scale, the accelerator programs don't really want you, right? It's the same catch 22 as the pitch competitions, right? Small percentage get in. So the question becomes, can you get in? It is a great opportunity, again, right now for female and minority entrepreneurs. Um, there are accelerator programs for non, uh, nonprofit organizations in addition to for-profit organizations. So that could be something to look at. Um, and then uh, obviously an accelerator program for a nonprofit can't take any equity and probably wouldn't be debt driven. So uh, it would probably be a grant um, but accelerator programs can do debt or equity. They most, they usually do what is called a convertible note, which is debt, a debt statement that within a certain period of time says, you know, here's $10,000. Um, you know, you, within the next three years, you can either as a company pay it off 
or it will convert to equity in the company. And that's what a convertible note is. It's a debt statement that converts to equity over a period of time if you don't pay it off. Uh, there's equity crowdfunding. So we talked about Kickstarter and some of the things earlier. There's uh, the Jobs Act, uh, which probably passed in 2010, allows you to sell a percentage of your company through online crowdfunding platforms. Uh, there's also a Invest Georgia Act that allows you to do it in Georgia. Um, we were the second state in the nation to allow it even before the federal government. Um, but to the right, you see Seed Invest, Fundable, AngelList. Those are those are platforms that allow you to do it. You do have to register with the SEC. You do have to abide by their rules and standards. Um, so it's it's something to research. Um, there is some thought that if you do equity crowdfunding via the Jobs Act, that you will not be that venture capitalists will not quote unquote like it and they may not invest in you in the future. So it is a consideration uh, around that. Um, but you, the Seed Invest uh, group, I've seen some restaurants on it. I've seen uh, some retail stores on it. So it's not just tech startups. Um, then there's angel funding. So angel funding is an accredited high net worth individual. I said earlier, I think they have to have 200K or a million dollars in net worth. They invest their own money in your company. They do have to be registered. You do have to register them with the SEC. Um, they are typically seeking an ROI. I mean, they certainly don't want to lose their money. So they put $5,000 in your business. They want at least $5,000 back. Um, you know, there's some statistics there. There's 258 active angel investors that invest roughly 20 billion a year in 60 companies. 60,000 companies, right? So, and you know, that means 0.91% of tech startups get angel investment, by the way. So um, the key around angel funding is a lot like donors uh, for nonprofits. These are high net worth individuals and they have to be passionate about your business or your nonprofit or your cause, right? The best uh, investors, understand the problem you're trying to solve and can maybe help you solve it, right? They, they get it. And lastly, we have venture funding, which is, you know, venture fund, funds are professional, managed by professional money managers and they invest other people's money, right? Um, so last year there were 462 active venture capitalists. They invested $22 billion in 3,700 companies per year. Right. So that's roughly less than 1% of the companies that started last year. You were definitely selling a percentage of your company and they are definitely seeking an ROI, right? They want a 10 times, 15 times their money. Um, so that's kind of that. And then the last thing for for-profit businesses and, and actually possibly for nonprofit businesses, right? If you've created value, right? And you just are done, can you sell your business, right? Um, so you might sell it to a competitor or a partner. You might sell it to an individual. I mean, uh, right. I believe Elevate was originally 98 broads. I may be wrong. That may be a different Elevate, um, right? But that was a nonprofit that eventually Sally Crenshaw took over. And so there's, there's transition, right, uh, between leaders, even of nonprofits, and how do you ensure um, that, that it continues? I think that's it. There's my contact information. I'm going to uh, go ahead. If anybody's got any questions, Feel free to unmute, ask questions. Um, specifically for nonprofits, um, you know, I, I just think it's digging deep into your donor databases and understanding who's in there and who's, who's doing okay and who's not. Um, launching new campaigns that are strategically in line with 
topics that are top of mind for people right now, such that they're passionate about it and leveraging that. But I have seen a plethora of grant funds come across. Um, and certainly for something like Elevate around underserved youth, urban youth, I definitely have seen some, fun, some grant funding that would apply for that, uh, that, that would be relevant for that. Any questions? Thank you. Awesome. If there are no questions, I will um, stop record. Uh, this will be on the Creative Press website probably later this afternoon under uh, resources slash online learning. And it's you know free for all to view. So if you've got friends or, or folks that are interested, it will be out there. Um, and thanks for joining us. Cool, thanks.